Thank you, and good afternoon to all of you. <clears throat> Today we have the extreme good fortune of having with us four exceptionally articulate, highly respected, very experienced professionals and people who have been colleagues and friends for a number of years and are treasured, all of them. We have Dean Danielle Conway of Penn State Dickinson Law. We have Redeen Keahiolo. Keahi Damn, I knew I shouldn't blow that. <laughs> Keahiolalo. <laughs> Sandra Sims, thanks for having me much easier. And Bill Harrison. <laughs> We're going to talk about racial and ethnic injustice in a particular sector, but as exemplary of what's happening in virtually all sectors and needs to be understood and dealt with. We have reached the enough already point. Hey, Radine, can you start us off with an example from history of where we went way wrong and what's happened since? Sure, um, thank you very much for having me, uh, Chuck. And and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I did my research on the political history of incarceration in Hawaii. And um, one of the things as a political scientist that I wanted to look at was uh, how different systems and networks play into the disproportionate um, incarceration and disparate treatment of Native Hawaiians um, in the justice system. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I did with my research was to look at different case studies throughout history. And one that was really striking, uh, which is very not well known, uh, is the public hanging of Chief Kamanava, who was Lili'u and Kalakaua's uh, grandfather. Um, a lot of us in Hawaii know about the overthrow that happened in 1893, but we don't know um, the, the actual genealogy of punishment really in Hawaii and how it all began with the coming of missionaries and the change in the landscape with um, Western ways and Western culture and Western laws. Um, in 1840, uh, Chief Kamanava was found uh, allegedly uh, guilty of committing adultery uh, which, which was a foreign law, um, obviously for Native Hawaiians, and is alleged to have uh, murdered his wife to, uh, to escape uh, some of the consequences that uh, would have come for him. Um, Chief Kamanava was the very first person in Hawaii to be publicly hanged at the Honolulu Fort before, uh, depending on the source that you read, before either 800 or 10,000 Native Hawaiian witnesses who were forced to witness the hanging at gunpoint. Um, there's a book called uh, Governing um, Through Crime. And I think there's a really big difference between governing crime and governing through crime. And what I mean is that by making the public hanging a spectacle, a public spectacle, really what, what the missionaries at the time were trying to do was to sort of politically inscribe foreign power. Um, in particular, that was really important because the chief was of one of the highest ranks. Um, at the same time that this was happening, it's important to note that the young uh, the last two monarchs in Hawaii who were children at the time were attending royal boarding school, um, which really was a setting much like a juvenile detention home uh, where the teachers sort of were surveilling and ha having these verbal um, contests with the royal children rather than really educating them. Um, and if you look, uh, read through the diaries of the missionary uh, teachers at the time who also orchestrated the public lynching, uh, you will see that uh, it was a very, uh, very racialized um, mm -hmm. forms of punishment, um, including not only verbal, um, verbal abuse, but also physical abuse, broken bones, broken shoulders, um, you know, 
withholding food. And we find a lot of those kinds of disciplinary punishments in prisons as well. Um, so at the same time this was happening, uh, there were also numerous articles that were written on the US continent about how well uh, the Americans were doing in Hawaii to uh, sort of help the heathens, uh, you know, rehabilitate them. And, and, and there was a lot of talk about the public hanging and the way that um, it was a good thing and how um, Americans were bringing this sort of civility into Hawaii. Um, one of the things that I really am interested in uh, as part of the research too is how the criminal subject is identified and, you know, I often tell people, if you close your eyes and somebody says, well, there's a criminal that just ran in the store and, and robbed it, like, what would you picture? Mm. What's the skin color? What's the gender? Um, are they poor? Are they rich? Um, and I think we, we know the answer. They're black, they're brown, they're poor, um, they're demonized. Um, and I think there's a construction of the criminal identity that occurs through many forms and many systems that work together, whether it be through narrative or policy or um, media. Um, you know, following the children, uh, the children's experience um, of actually uh, witnessing their grandfather being publicly hanged as well when they became adults and started to engage in the legislature, um, there was this um, concerted effort to demonize them as uh, drug lords when they were trying to decriminalize opium. And at the same time, the very people who were demonizing them in the legislature were confiscating, you know, thousands of dollars worth of opium and selling it to the British. So um, I guess my point is um, when we look at the justice system, we need to look at what's not being said and what's not being seen, mm -hmm. what's not so visible. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think it's a very complex system um, that feeds off of each other, enables um, this disparate treatment to continue. And, you know, we might not have, um, we might not see things so obviously today, um, but the subtleties are, are just as dangerous, just oh, as mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's kind of in a nutshell, my research. Mm. Mm. So Bill, as, Bill, as a criminal defense attorney for decades here, what's the reality of how this system impacts? Okay, so we, we fast forward, we fast forward to today. And that historical perspective is in place today. Exactly. Um, if we bring up some of the charts as to who do we imprison, it's clear that we imprison black people, brown people. Um, specifically, if you look at these charts, and these were done um, about uh, within the last uh, five to 10 years, there is clearly a significant imbalance in the prison population relative to uh, Polynesians, uh, black mm -hmm. folks. Um, and Clearly, their numbers in society are well overrepresented in the prison system, and that's yeah. that's the same way nationally as well. But this this brings home uh, to roost here in Hawaii that this is commonplace, and it, it goes back to the implicit uh, racialism or implicit biases in the system that started back um, as Radine speaks about uh, with this hanging and and a time of imperialism. It just continues on, and um, as this implicit bias is systematic. Um, all of our parties in the system here uh, don't even know what's happening, but continue to perpetrate yeah. it uh, yeah. without knowing it's happening. And, exactly. and you look at the numbers that we have here, these charts, um, they don't lie. Look at the, the over imbalance in terms of the incarcerated individuals in our system. And they're clearly weighted um, significantly on the Polynesian uh, and, um, and black scales. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit yesterday, but I want to bring this point up that, you know, one of the first things that, I, that I, I learned as I became a criminal defense attorney going through the system, and you can see these numbers here, um, I went in on a Saturday in the prison here, and it was the old uh, Oahu prison, which is OP, mm -hmm. and, and Saturdays the families are there, and the families are, um, I'm, I'm walking in here, and I'm a young attorney, this is the, 
the early 80s. I know I look like I just started, you know, practicing, but right. <laughs> I've been around a while. We know different. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I go in there and uh, I see these kids running all around in the prison and fathers are coming out from, you know, the, uh, the cell blocks coming into the, the population area and they're high-fiving one another to shock and one another. And the kids see this and they see it's a normal system. It's normal for them and their, and their dads to be in this prison system. And it just continues to, um, you know, perpetuate itself. And, yeah. and we need to look at that specifically. Uh, I've gone through three generations of, of family members, you know, from grandpa to, to son to grandson representing them. And, and clearly that kind of normal attitude um, is prevalent and, and that continues the cycle. We need to break that cycle. And so yeah. that's really a concern for me is that we have this overrepresentation in the prison system. And, and, and uh, in particular, we have um, a system that as those early charts say that we incarcerate more people than anybody else in the world, okay? The world. And one of those charts, yeah. And one of those charts show that Hawaii um, over incarcerates more people than many nations. Uh, and this is just one state, okay? Mm -hmm. So clearly we have to address that. And, and that sort of the, the most recent trend in the mainland is we have to step away from locking people up from the time of Absolutely. arrest, you know, on down. And we have to realize the, the um, devastation you do when you, when you actually um, incarcerate someone because you take that person away from the income, you take that person away from their families, the families suffer, it, you know, it's just pervasive and it just spreads uh, mm -hmm. beyond uh, the initial thought of we have to take these people off the streets. We have to rethink that process. Um, yeah. And these figures show that. Yeah. And judge Sims, what did you encounter as a judge with people coming before you that showed you this pattern? I think uh, Bill is absolutely right. And I think we shared, I shared one of the incidents that, that, that I recall um, involving a young man who had come before me at the time he was at that time he was just turning 18 and coming into the adult system. Uh, his father was incarcerated. In fact, I had imprisoned his father uh, for some very serious charges, but he had his name and it was a you know well-known name within you know some criminal circles. And here was this young man uh, coming into the criminal justice system, uh, having had some issues with as a juvenile. But much of that conduct that he was involved in had to do with the fact that he was carrying the father's name. And people would just literally come at him expecting that this is what you were going to do. And his goal was to try to kind of pull away, but he couldn't, we, you know, because it was just, people expected that from him. And then when he came into the system, no one could see beyond that, that this is the name you have. And so therefore you must be um, wanting to do this. So even like what Bill is talking about, the, the, the ability to kind of like break that, to break that system was even apparent to me then. At some point, we've got to stop. And so one day I just actually asked him, you know, like, you know, what you're doing is you're fighting people, not because you're wanting to fight, but they're calling you out because of who you are or expecting that you want to do something. And I said, so what is it that you want to do? <laughs> and he told me, I want to be a plumber. So here we have this person, you know, we've, we've labeled them like, like Radine was pointing out, we have this notion of a criminal identity. So we have this person who's, a, who's appearing there is like, yes, your name is so and so you are you are Native Hawaiian. So therefore, you must be a part of this system, we've got to begin to see people away from that notion of a criminal identity and see people as people. Not everybody, you know, that's kind of one of the things that I sort of have a pension about is like not making that stereotypical um, uh, identity with someone just because of that. You're, you know, and it was, it was so, it was, he was a, you know, really smart young man, but teachers had labeled him, the community had labeled him, and hence there he was until this, this crazy lady asked him, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to be a plumber. I'm like, okay, let's figure it out. You know, you know but um, I mean, we're laughing about it, but these are very serious uh, issues. And, and I couldn't help but note the parallel between 
uh, the chief's hanging, the very public hanging and lynching that took place in, this place in the South. The idea was the same, to really sort of instill this fear um, and within those who were forced to watch because blacks were forced to watch it as well, to see this is what's gonna happen to you if you run afoul of, you know, of our, 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 our system. And so again, you get that sort of uh, generational in, in, what did you call it, Bradine, historical trauma? Is that what it is? Intergenerational okay. trauma. Intergenerational trauma. And you, you have that as well, carrying it over into, into these communities. And so, yeah, those are those are some of the things that I, 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 I saw as well. Thanks, Chuck, for asking. So Dean Conway, in your position as having to somehow bring our educational system with law students, people who are going to go out and deal directly with our legal system with this problem of normalizing conditioning that builds almost ironclad patterns, walls that it's hard for youth to get out of. How does that impact how our educational system and our legal system's response to it have to change? So some of the change uh, is going to happen because of this movement that we are seeing, Black Lives Matter, uh, LGBTQ. We are looking at indigenous peoples and how they are being uh, now identified as the center of harm. Take the Washington Redskins and the final recognition uh, based in economic discourse, mm -hmm. that this should not be the name. I mean, so there are these all these opportunities to look at how we address this and how we, in systems like a law school, teach, respond, lead. But what I want to say is I want to intervene in the conversation because we are talking about what I call the criminal industrial complex, not the criminal justice system. Exactly. And that yeah. we have to intervene where the problems are happening and that's the systems that precede any connection to the criminal industrial complex. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about disproportionate poor education for black and brown people, indigenous people, health disparities in these communities that first of all, make it harmful for them to work, but then we don't wanna employ them. So that brings in the employment. And so then they become, oh, look at us in COVID-19, essential workers on the front line. So we have employment disparities. We have income and poverty disparities. And so all of these work together against black and brown people to cement the institutional racism and bias that acts on them. And then when you're trying to do something to help your situation, you come up against the laws that sometimes aren't even written to respond to how you have been disproportionately impacted. They're responding to another segment of the community and what that community thinks about black and brown people. Yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. That's so exactly. my responsibility is to teach that and then to teach how the law sh should not be handled as some romantic notion, but rather how we can use it as a tool to try to disrupt these institutions and the systematic discrimination and bias that we experience mm -hmm. in these communities. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, hey, and that generates the question, is there a connection between educational teaching of equality right from the very beginning within the home, within the schools, within the society and reinforcement of equality in all sectors, housing, education, healthcare, employment, income, 
-hmm. mental health. Yeah, there, there's a great deprogramming that has to happen. And one of my uh, one of my desires out of this movement is that people latch on to this opportunity to begin to learn about history, the history that Radine is sharing with us, the history that Sandra alluded to. And if you read any of Ida B. Wells's work to, def to explain lynching in post-reconstruction communities, when you see books that talk about Jim Crow and the slave codes, that reinforced institutional racism so as to keep racial hierarchy in place, even though the law said, we're going to enfranchise you. These are opportunities to learn, mm -hmm. not to close your eyes and stick your head in the sand. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> you know, I shudder to Happen. think about the impact that we're making on the children who are at our borders, mm. the, in the cages and sleeping under those um, aluminum or mats, the impact that that generation is, is going to have on what we do in our systems. These are, these are, these are kids, children, and who are, this is the impression that they are being given. And so how do you, how do we expect that that generation is going to respond to how they have been seen, regarded and treated in this system now? Well, Bill so gave us proof, right? Bill, Bill gave us the proof. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, the job is, it, it, in this regard, it's gonna be very difficult because we have to dismantle as everyone's talking about yeah. the system to start that again. we have. And yeah, and educate people that the system that they've put in place that they thought were to be systems to take care of their, their communities and the safety and, and prosperity really has done the exact opposite. Yeah, it's opposite. caused this exactly. instability, right? In, in our systems and in our, our communities. So we need to refocus and, and redefine what we really want uh, in our communities. And that's gonna be the real difficult part. And, it's wonderful that we are now having this discussion uh, because unfortunately, you know, people have been killed, black people have been killed uh, in the process. But this has been going on for generations and no one's been talking about it in the manner that we're talking about it now. So we have to grasp this time um, and, and use this time in, in a wise manner to go forward with a, a different perspective as to how we're going to um, look at these systems. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a good point. Okay, and in doing that, let me ask all of you, it, the political process is the mechanism that enacts changes in at least formal laws. It may not be in the attitudes or the practices or perspectives or behaviors of people as we've seen. But how do we get past what is in essence right now a racial ethnic class war being waged between one party and the rest of the country? Ray Dean, you want to speak to that first? I, really, I think, I, and I, me included, I think there's been a lot of apathy around voting for many years, but I, I think we're all waking up as to how important that is. And I'm just going to talk about our, our local uh, prosecutorial race is now is the time for us to get behind a progressive candidate. And uh, I watched the recent debate and uh, was so surprised that two candidates actually do not believe there's implicit bias in the system. Um, this is the 21st century. I, I don't know how anybody can say that. And the other ones may feel that, but they didn't say it. Um, but I do know, you know, at least one candidate is showing that she's very progressive. And I think we need to start rallying around those people and changing the system, starting with the way we vote and educate ourselves before we make the vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and one of the problems with, um, you know, politics is that money is an issue. To be elected, you need the money, all right? And that, that's always been a problem here because, um, you know, as Daniel points out, we've got this industrial complex. When we're talking about uh, this issue with regard to the, like, for instance, the prison system, 
you have a, a, a prison system, Core Civic, that leases prisons to us. It, it spends money on politicians to make sure that this whole system continues because yeah. bodies in the prison is important for Core Civic. Okay, so those kinds of things where we have politicians that are dependent upon money to, to, to be elected, uh, that runs afoul of what we really need here. We need people that want to be there and not mm -hmm. have to be beholden to any kind of a, um, you know, individual or, or organization. And I want to go back to Danielle's comment, which I think is an extremely valuable insight and an important one, the allusion to John Kenneth Galbraith's military industrial complex mm -hmm. as what is currently a criminal industrial complex. There are literally huge entities making obscene amounts of money off of the excessive incarceration, both in number and in duration of racially, ethnically disproportionate groups. That puts money in their pockets Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and they in turn put money in the pockets of the politicians uh -huh. who endorse and further that system. Yeah. I mean, the Correct. idea yeah. as we were growing up <laughs> that we would have so many incarcerated black and brown people that we would need to send some to Arizona of all places, which when we were growing up was the home of Goldwater. <laughs> Another good reason not to send people there. Yeah. 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 How do we turn this around? Yeah, to step away from it. I, I just want to say, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, but how do we move away from a society that values retribution over rest, restoration and rehabilitation? I mean, it's part of the culture to be vindictive and, you know, want to punish, mm -hmm. punish. Yeah, interesting. I shared with, uh, I, I also teach sometimes at the Shabbat in the criminal justice program. And I shared with my students once, once the notion that the, um, the correctional company um, that does so many of the prisons wanted to name an athletic stadium for, mm -hmm. I think it was Florida Atlantic University. Mm -hmm. They wanted to donate the money to, and I just mentioned it, you know, to the students. I think Bill, you might've been there for that one. And they were simply appalled. It's like, wait a minute, is this the place that mm -hmm. is going to be, is building prisons and now they want to come on a college campus and tell us what uh, by their support. So I think like you said, we're getting, there's this awareness and this coming to this realization, you know, addressing the issues of apathy that our young people have to start thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Why should a prison be financing our stadium? Mm -hmm. Hey. What, are they want to, what are they telling us? What do they want us to know? <laughs> and, and I apologize. Kind of yeah. come to the end of our time for today, but real quick wrap up one minute shot, Danielle. Thank you again for having me and for continuing these discussions. This is what we should be doing. Come back in two weeks. There will be more. Radine, last words. Uh, I, I, you know, I just think we need to keep our finger on the pulse and, and not let go. Use this time wisely, as Bill said. This is the time we have. Is use it wisely. We have an opportunity to really uh, speak to our communities and our constituents, and this is the time to do it. Absolutely. Bill? Yes, grasp it and go with it right now. Now's the time. The moment. You get a small window. Mm -hmm. Enough 111 already. days, actually. <laughs> Thank you all. Let's regather in two weeks. Thanks, Chuck. This has Thank been you. a great discussion. Thank you so much. Take good care. Thank you. Take care.